Hola, hola. Buenas noches. How is everybody? So glad you could join me tonight. Uh, I would say I'm very excited about tonight's conversation, but I am generally always excited about the conversations we have here. But I am low-key very excited um, because this is a conversation I didn't think was going to happen. And now it is happening. So I'm really <laughs> excited for that. Um, if you are here joining us live, say hello in the chat. I see Winnie is here. A is it Eileen or Aileen uh, is here? Cupcake season. Every day is cupcake season as far as I'm concerned. I love that name. Uh, I see you're here as well. Um, I'll go ahead. Hey, Lisa and D and Tanya Long A. So Aileen. Um, that used to be my middle name. It wasn't spelt the same way. Hey, Adrian. It wasn't spelt the same way, but it was a name I didn't particularly care for. So when I um, changed my name after my divorce, I just decided to do without it and not pick it back up. All right, y'all. Um, what do I want to say? Okay. Um, I think you saw from the title of tonight's conversation, we're we going to be getting into it. Um, but I was going to say, there's so much that has already been said about this, but I don't, I don't know that we can ever stop talking about, um, you know, the BS that is hustle culture. And I think it takes a lot for, you know, those of us who have gotten free, I think we need to keep talking about it to help other folks get free. Um, and so, Tonight, we're going to be talking about hustle culture. We're going to be talking about how Black women really need to reject hustle culture because it's all a lie uh, and it's going to kill you. And we're also going to be talking about how to embrace ease, how to design your life of ease um, with my very, very special guest. Uh, but before we jump into that, in case you are new here, if the YouTube algorithm served this video up to you, I want to be the first person to say welcome to the Picky Girl Nation. We are very glad you are here. I am Adelia Aborashade. Uh, although most people on the internet know me as Picky Girl Travels or Picky Girl Travels the World, I'm picky. <laughs> I travel a lot and I left the U.S. permanently seven years ago. I want women like you to be free. I want you to be free from society's expectations as well as your own limiting beliefs. Um, I share all about these things, getting free, traveling, living abroad. I share about all those things here on this YouTube channel. Um, so no matter where you are in the journey, I bet you there's some content on this channel that could help you. So we are glad you are here. Feel free uh, to subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. You'll find out when I go live, like I'm doing right now. Okay. So um, hold on. I just realized, I was like, why is it, why aren't the names showing? And that's, there we go. All right. So joining me tonight is Kira of Designing Ease. Uh, she is joining me from uh, I was going to say one of my favorite cities, but y'all would know I was lying. Uh, Guadalajara, Mexico. Um, and so we're, we're going to just start really, really basically. Um, your platform is Designing Ease. You're Designing Ease on TikTok, Instagram, here on YouTube. When you, what do you mean by ease? Well, what I mean by ease is creating a life that in all aspects of my life, it feels good. Every part of my life brings me joy. 
from the way I wake up in the morning, the clothes that I put on, the people that I engage with, the psychological safety, how I move my body, the things that I consume, just every aspect of my life is customized to something that makes me want to enjoy life. So doing what I want to do, how I want to do it, when I want to do it, on my terms and not being told what to do, that is ease to me. Okay. All right. Now, a little bit of background about you. For the folks who who may not know who you are, they may not recognize your face, um, you you had it all. (laughs) You were out there living the American dream. You were, you know, like the poster child for Black excellence. You had the the high high power job, you had the big gorgeous house, you had the nice cars, you were doing all of that, okay? Um, so I, I help us figure out like why is why are you now trying to Im- design ease, embracing ease? You girl, you was living the dream. And I was absolutely miserable every single day. I felt as though I created a prison for myself. And this kind of goes back to childhood because I've always been told that, you know, I'm a rebel without a cause and I'm marching to the beat of my own drum because I had these desires that did not align with being a preacher's child and being a part of that Black excellence. So I just kind of fell in line and I was good at it. I was good academically. You know, I excelled in school. Um, I was good in professional spaces, no matter what space I was in. People said, you're a great leader. Um, You do these things easily, they come naturally. And before I knew it, I was a director (laughs) over 16 companies and going to this house that I was tied to a 30 year mortgage in this car, chauffeuring my kids around to all of these activities and not just necessarily dropping them off, but being the 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 team mom, bringing the snacks, dropping the other kids off. And I just never had an opportunity to what I call ex, just exhale. And after a while, I just asked myself, what is all this for? <laughs> What's the end game? Like, why am I doing this? And I'm completely miserable. Um, So I began crafting a plan that I'm going to go back to this life that as a child, I told people that I wanted and they told me it was a fairy tale. But I began to think, well, I can do that when I uh, when I retire. Then um, I got um, some financial advisors and they began to ask me questions about what my life looked like after my children were all adult age. And then that began had me thinking, well, instead of me waiting till I retire, maybe I will live this life that I want in 10 years. But the toxic work environment, the strain of it all, again, this prison that I had created for myself was absolutely miserable that I'm like, I have to do it now because the results of that began to manifest in my physical body as well as my mental health. And it's something that I knew that I could not give another six or eight years or 10 years to. And that's when I stumbled upon you and others. And I'm like, huh, is everyday Black folk that's doing this right now? (laughs) So take me out. I don't want to do it anymore. (laughs) This is not the end game. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm screaming from the mountaintop that I don't enjoy this. But people are just like, high five, you go, you super mom, you power worker, keep going. And I'm like, no, I don't want out. Unsubscribe me. This is too much. And how how long into this life did it take you to get to that point where you were like, I don't, I don't, this, this ain't it. This is not, this can't be it. This came right after I finished checking all of the boxes. Um, I graduated college in December. Um, I just landed my dream job. It's my highest paying job that I ever had. I never thought I would make this much money. I had it, like you say, I had it all. I checked all of the boxes. And again, the stress and the burnout was wearing me down so much. Um, And I remember one day, being at home, watching videos. I like to watch these travel videos. I'm like, 
let me see how people are living in other parts of the world. <laughs> right? And I fell asleep and I woke up and that's when it was a stream of videos about Exodus. And this was October. So almost one year today, October last year. And I say, you know what? I'm moving. That is just like in that moment, I made a decision and it was all things go. I didn't look back. I didn't question it. I didn't think too much about it. I just said, I'm going to make this happen. So from October to June, that's how quickly it escalated. And that's why I'm in Guadalajara right now. Okay. See, I, I don't think I realized, I knew like you just blew your life up like recently. I knew that, but I don't think I realized that there was basically no gap between the idea and the execute well and and I guess I shouldn't be surprised because that's part of the reason why you were able to achieve what you achieved in your career is the follow through the execution. Now you talked about burnout, you talked about health. Um you want to say a little bit more about that? Because I, I would often I would say that the way we are conditioned in the US is like to believe that that's just a small price you got to pay for this monetary success. And that's exactly what I was told. But um, I guess let's say the last five years or so, maybe a little bit longer. Um, initially, it started with alopecia. Right. And I thought it was something hereditary. And the dermatologist was telling me, it's your stress levels. You need to bring your stress down. But I'm losing my hair. So, you know, I do what we do. I got a weave and a wig and I kept it pushing, never adjusting the stress in my life. Um, and then it came with the high blood pressure. And then um, I always joke and tell people I'm vegan ish, you know. Like I'm going to eat vegan most of the time, but every now and then. So I'm doing all of these things to like change my diet and my blood pressure is still through the roof and it's the stress. And I'm like, but I like my life. I'm doing the things. I have the things. I have the job. You know, um, I don't have a lot of discourse in my personal life. Like, why am I so stressed out? Um, then it began to manifest in um, stomach problems. Um, where I was diagnosed with diverticulitis, where I would have these episodes. And I just felt like my body was turning on me. And it was really just years of my body signaling, you need to slow down. And I ignored it. Um, then that turned into insomnia. And I was going for sleep apnea tests. And they had me going to all of these specialists. Um, and then my primary care doctor was like, I think you should talk to somebody. And I had a Black therapist. I let her know everything was going on. Seven minutes into our first session, she said, you're burnt out. Uh, the burnout, the stress, that's the manifestation of the hair loss, the stomach problems, the high blood pressure, not being able to sleep. That's just what it is. And I had never up until that point heard about burnout. No one had ever told me I was burnt out. And that was, I want to say, June of 2021 is when I heard of that, but I, I didn't change my life because now I'm a director. I worked 17 years to become a director, the first Black female director in this role. I can't slow down. And it was killing no, me. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Like this, this is, this is what we're all supposed to be striving for. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, listening at you say, tell that story, there might be someone who maybe doesn't have the experience uh, that melanated folks have moving through the world who might say, well, it's obvious, girl, that job ain't worth all of this stress so on and so forth. But for those of us who grew up in the U.S. system, who grew up under the specter of Black excellence, of course, you do whatever it takes to get that position, to hold on to it. Um, we never, I, when you said this, that this was like the first time you'd even heard burnout, we never talk about that. We never talk about 
the potential costs, all of this striving and achieving and ignoring, you know, the, the natural uh, warning system that our body gives us, what that can result in. So um, we, we, it, it's all about the end goal, checking the boxes, achieving the thing. And you did say you were ignoring your body. Because if you think back, I'm going to guess your body had been letting you know in subtle ways for quite a while that things weren't great. It was, but again, it, that came with the territory. And as I began to analyze it and heal from it more and more, I asked myself, like, where did this start? And it started just as a kid. This is how I was groomed, right? Um, especially growing up in the Southern Bible Belt. I grew up in Atlanta. I'm a preacher's kid. So we were at church all the time. You know, I idol mine. It's the devil's workshop. So I was always in all of these activities. And even on, the, on Sunday when the good Lord rested, no, we were in church three times. You know, so I just always had this jam-packed, schedule. And I just never knew, like, if there was a slot on my schedule, I'm thinking about the next thing that I need to do to be productive. Like, why I lay here when I can do some laundry or, you know, clean out my emails or reorganize something to make the rest of the week easier. Um, so instead of me resting on Sunday, let me get up and iron clothes for four people for the entire week. So maybe I don't have to do it. I just never stopped because I was conditioned to believe sitting, resting, listen to your body, not having to be in this productive mode, not having to produce it, that somehow something was wrong with that. So I didn't know. And I began to feel bad when I had nothing to do or had a clear day. So I just always feel, 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 go, 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 hustle, bustle, just nonstop. And um, I know I would talk to my, my dad about it. And he's like, just just six more years. You got it. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. <laughs> you said it went back to childhood. And that made me think about, we, we're we indoctrinating our kids and we don't even realize it. Because um, I remember feeling the pressure to, like, once my kids got to be like five, six, it was like, okay, so I got to enroll them in some kind of sport. They've got to have after school activities. And I was thinking that if I didn't do those things, I was falling down on my job as mom. But really what we're doing when we're doing that is we're just perpetuating this whole, the whole busyness culture, this whole thing about the value is in the productivity. Uh, because listening at what you just said, given all that was going on in your life, all the folks you're taking care of, everything you're doing at work, obviously taking a rest has value because we all know you cannot fill from an empty cup. Yet the system has got us thinking that if we even slow down to take a breath, we're falling down on the job. And this is just the price you pay for success. It's the whole too much is given, much is required. So I really believe that these things were required of me. And even when navigating the corporate space and I moved up the ladder, then there were so many additional things that came with that. Being on board of directors, mentoring other people. So even outside of my work and then even in my personal time, I know like every first Saturday of the month, I would go out on my personal time to mentor people. Because I felt like that was what I was supposed to do that was attached to this job. So it, let me mentor something. I'm working on the weekend. I need to leave here, go to the soccer field. Let me go to the grocery store, pack this. So it was just constantly just going, going, and going. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that about the kids. It wasn't until about, I think, last year or so after the, the talk of the therapist. She's like, no, you burnt out. I remember one Saturday. It was about noon, and my kids were still in the bed. And initially I was telling them to get up. And then I asked myself, why? Why? I just let them lay there. And even with that, sometimes um, over the last couple of years, every now and then I struggle with it. Um, just 
when they're not doing anything. And in my brain, I'm like, they're not lazy. I'm sure they're tired because I'm tired. I'm exhausted. So I'm pretty sure that they are. So that has been um, quite a blessing to me for that. Um, and then just even as I'm re unlearning in a lot of things, giving them those tools early in their life so that they don't build uh, the mess that I did. I'm just saying this mess. Like if that's what people want to do, then that's what you want to do. But take me out. I don't want it. <laughs> you all can have it. <laughs> Okay. So you, you get this word burnout. And so that's still some time between then and this past October. So what were you doing in between? Were you, were you trying to make substantive changes or was it like, okay, I know what it's called, but I still got to do what I got to do. Yeah, it was a little bit of both. So I continued, but I, I like saying I'm going to make these changes and I was implementing small things like working on my sleep hygiene, eating a healthier diet, walking, stretching, doing those things. Um, and eventually I made the decision to quit my job. I had a job at a big telecommunication company. I was at that job for 14 years. I really thought I was gonna retire from this place. And I knew that that was a trigger, like a source of stress for me. So I just mustered up the courage to leave that job. And I went to the job as a director. So I doubled my pay. I got the uh, the title. I thought it was going to be better. And I went to work. And more work. money. More money is supposed to fix everything. All the time. And I thought that it was. I thought that it was. Um, and initially when I worked, left the company, um, I was working for an amazing boss. Amazing. And that's where I began to feel protected. I felt like I had resources to really navigate. Um, someone believed in me. They saw me. They saw my value. They were positioning me for success without the load. If I said something was too much, they did not push back on it. And I was like, wow, I should have, I thought it was the job. I should have left that job before. However, he had an opportunity to go on in his career. And that's when new leadership came in. And I was like, oh, it's not, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I just lucked up and had a great leader. And now that that covering is gone, I'm feeling the weight. But this time it's 10 times full because of that dollar. It's like, oh, you, you want to get paid this? Okay, so we're going to work you three times as much. So it was it was really that toxic work environment. And I felt myself spiraling again, going deeper into this hole. And I was like, I'm not going to make it. So in October, when I saw those videos, and it was specifically a video, I think Stephanie did, interviewing different women around the world. And they were just talking about how they can sleep at night, how they felt safe, how their nervous system was regulated, how they were able to move. And I saw yours, you were talking about moving with your child. My brain clicked and it never, it never went back. I knew that it was possible. And I know what I was able to do with little to nothing to achieve that dream. So I was going to throw everything at living a life, designing something that was easeful for me, that I felt good about, that I can have slow morning, <laughs> that I don't have to be a product of just going to work and being labeled. And when people meet me, the first thing they ask me, what do you do? That I'm not in carpool lanes every day. I was like, oh my gosh, people are doing this. Like right now, in this moment, and hit. Like, why am I, I ask myself, like, why are you doing this again? Why are you subjecting yourself to this type of abuse when literally it is killing you? It is killing you. So why are you doing it? And so when I locked in, it was October 17th, October 17th. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. that's when I started selling everything and it was all, let's go. <laughs> okay. So I have to ask, you have this sort of a epiphany moment, like there is another way to live. That's not just something, you know, rich white folks can do. There are, there are sisters out there that look like me that are living their lives in a different way. Why not 
try to embrace ease or design a life on your own terms in the U.S.? Because I have learned over the years that whenever I get to the mark that was that's being advertised, that, yeah, get this thing, you will have this ease. It, I felt like, oh, you got here? Okay, cool. Let me move the goalpost. So the goalpost continued to get moved. And I'm like, how many more things am I going to have to change to try to achieve this here? I switched jobs. I moved to different places in the U.S. Like I'm doing everything in this bubble of the states and it's not working. And at that point, again, the thing that I was taught, work smarter, not harder. So how can I achieve more with less? So <laughs> Where can I live comfortably? And I don't have to make, you know, over six figures in order to like, honestly, like six figures now is just like bare minimum living. I'm in Atlanta, in Atlanta. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm like, well, why is this happening? I grew up here. Why can I not afford to live here anymore? And the other places in the U.S. that I could live comfortably with less money, it's not safe for me to be there. <laughs> Just, it's not safe for me to live there. It's not conducive to raising my kids there that they're gonna come out mentally unscathed. So I'm no. just like, where else can I go to get this done? Absolutely. I, I asked that question because often, well, I don't wanna say often, but I am, as as wonderful as my life has been the last seven years since I left the United States, I had very, very specific uh, value-driven reasons why I left. Um, but if I could not have, I would have tried to pursue life on my terms in the U.S. It would look very different from the life that I have now. And, you know, there may be someone watching this who is like, Maybe they tune out what we're saying because it's like, oh, I got to move abroad for that. And it's, hey, everybody's decision whether or not to stay in the U.S., that is that is your personal business. Um, and there are going to be some people for whom they can live the life that they want staying in the U.S. But what you're saying is in your situation, the life that you envisioned for yourself and your kids that wasn't going to happen there. And that's that's fair. Yeah, that, that's correct. Especially, um, there are a few things, if I can hopefully paint a picture for people. I knew my health was important, right? Um, so I know I needed to move to a place that I could walk to most places, um, which will give me the physical movement. There was a point in time in my life that going to the gym excited me. That doesn't excite me. You know, let me just like, get some steps in. But living in most cities where you have a walkable neighborhood, that comes with a price tag. So that was a determining factor for me. You, everybody's price tag is different, right? I'm talking about my salary, uh, a family of four, kind of just navigating all of these things. Um, also, being able to get access to the foods that I want by me eating a mainly plant-based diet. <laughs> and it, typically that comes with a price tag versus now I can get that more affordably. So, of course, there's some bells and whistles that people always talk about, but I was thinking about how can I have an active life, right? Um, not have to get up at the crack of dawn, work eight hours a day and make enough money just to fund a life where I can wake up and not be summoned by an alarm clock. That I could walk easily to everything that I need so I can get the physical activity. I can engage my mind through curiosity about the new surroundings and learning things. So that's why it suits me. You can probably do that in the States, but I knew that I needed to get out of that. And I also 
believe in the back of my brain that if I would have stayed there, I don't know if I would have been able to get off of the hamster wheel because it's, is there? It's highlighted. It's, it's like, well, yes, it is. <laughs> you, uh, the analogy that popped in my head was like, there's a reason why when you get out of prison, they tell you you can't hang out with other felons. Like, and that's probably not the <laughs> the uh, comparison I should use, but it is very hard to break old patterns and old habits if you stay in the same environment. And the things that you were asking for, like a walkable neighborhood, edible food at an affordable price, these are not big ass. This this should not this should not be something that is hard to get in the United States, which is supposed to be the wealthiest country in the world. However, it is. And if you at a director's level are struggling with that, what you know, what is what is life like for just 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 your regular Joe Schmo, you know, um, that's that's not good. <laughs> good at all. OK, so you get this idea. And you waste no time. You start selling stuff and making plans. Now, you knew that you wanted out of the hustle culture. Um, how did you figure out where you wanted to go? Well, I've been country scouting since 2017. <laughs> But every year, twice a year, I would just travel to other countries. And I I became a, a one and done. Like I would go, it was good. I'm like, oh, that was cute. <laughs> you know? However, Mexico, the first time I visited Mexico was in 1999. And I don't know, I fell in love with it then. And I've traveled a lot of places. But out of all the places of being one and done, Mexico is the only place that is a repeater. If I'm like at my wit's end and need to go and find some peace and center myself, I always come to Mexico. And I've visited multiple parts, mainly tourist area. Um, but I always felt like, oh, I can see myself living here. I've gone to other countries and it's like, oh, that was nice to visit. But I'm like, I don't think I can see myself living here, especially when I began to think about where to move, like the cost of things or um I knew that eventually, I'm not working now, no rush either, but eventually when I begin to work, you know, I need access to the internet, all of these things, and I knew that I can find them here. So Mexico for me, just always, it has always felt good. Um, in full transparency though, I had never heard of Guadalajara. I couldn't tell you where it was on the map. <laughs> it was through. <laughs> Once it kind of clicked in my brain, I literally had a notebook that, you know, the five notebook divider things. And I was taking copious notes, watching hours and hours of videos on my ride to work, playing the YouTube audio, just like extensively studying and being so intentional that if anyone challenged it, I wanted to know. And I also knew that I was making the decision based on just my confirmed bias. Like I knew I wanted to do this. I was going to find all the things to justify it. But then I also began to uh, research things that I know my, my loved ones would ask me. And then people that like, okay, so why have people, if they moved to Mexico and it didn't work, why? Like, what are the odds? Like I researched everything and it just always, again, going back to how I originally started in designing ease, it felt good. So I'm like, this feels good. The proximity to the U.S., um, direct flights, you know, all of these things felt good to me. I came, I visited, I scouted it, and I said, hey, this is where I'm going. This is it. Now, you were not very public with your plans to move. Can we talk about that a little bit? Yes. Mm -hmm. I wasn't public Was because... I was the gold star. I am the gold star for my parents out of the kids. I'm the most successful. Uh, my family, I'm the inspiration. So I knew that it would be hard 
for them to accept that I'm telling them all of the things that you've worked so hard, like I, that you're supposed to get, it's a facade. Don't do it. <laughs> so you're, you're rejecting, you're rejecting the dream and you're saying the dream is a lie. And correct. everybody don't receive those words. <laughs> no, they the same don't. Way. No, because, it, you know, I'm the person that they call for the resource. I'm the person that people call for the inspiration. I'm the one that is made out to be like, it's possible. Kira did it. Kira's doing it. And I'm like, I'm struggling. I'm fighting for my life over here. So I didn't want to say it. Um, I also did not want seeds of doubt planted. I didn't want people to... Um, kind of just machete my plan. So I wanted to be well prepared um, thinking about things that they may have and questions that they may have, which also helped me because I tend to be um, a more op optimistic person, right? And I'm like, oh, it's all going to work out. Uh, but it did help me to better prepare for some of the responses that I knew that I would get. Um, but no, I didn't want to say it because I didn't want people to tell me. I hinted at it a couple times with my dad and that's when he was like six more years and I said you know what I'm not telling you till it's time for me to go because if you tell me six more years I'm going to boo who cry boo who cry because I am telling you I cannot do this another 60 years um so I selected my my uh sounding board of people that I would share this with um my I always say your friends are like medicine in the medicine cabinet. You got to know what to put on what, right? Um, yeah. So my friend that kind of gives it to me raw like alcohol, I didn't tell her <laughs> to the end. Um, so I got my Neosporin friend that kind of like helps me out a little bit and she knows the right things to say. Um, I knew that for the legal part of things like set, setting up my estate, my emergency contact where I need my documents. Um, I have my, what I call my favorite cousin. Um, I told her um, and I was like, I need, you know, I'm going to start signing some things over to you. And she didn't believe it at first. And she was like, you keep sending me these papers. It's not registering. <laughs> like, we're meeting. You're giving me this information. It's not registering that that's what you're doing. Um, so I told her, um, and then I told my mentor, but I think less than five people really knew um, what I was doing. Because I, I, and then sometimes people are just, they mask their fear as concern. Yeah. And I didn't want to deal with that. I, I didn't want to deal with that because I was also having to explain to my children why this is happening and how their lives were going to change. So I didn't need a lot of outside influence really um, smudging the life of ease that I was needing to design. And it, it, there isn't a right or wrong choice here. It's, I think it works for everybody. Um, but I asked because I'm curious about, I'm curious about a couple of things, but like when you did spill the beans, was it, was it received with shock? Was it, I knew something was up with her uh, or, you know, because I can only imagine, like you said, you were the gold star. You were held up as the example. And then and you flip the script and you're like, you know what? I'm selling the house. I'm selling the car. I quit the job and I'm moving to Mexico. Like, I can't imagine how that was received. It was a, a mixed bag. Um, people who know that I'm just, I have always been a free spirit. Like, I'll say I'm going to lunch and I'll be in Miami somewhere. Like, I'm not lunch in Atlanta. Like, no, it's a, a cheap flight. I'm going to Miami. I start a restaurant. So the people that know that side and embrace that side of me, it was just like, oh, I knew it. Um, and then my close circle of friends, they've always, like, I have a lot of nicknames. And one of my nicknames is Carmen San Diego because it's like, where in the world is Kira? Because I would go. I would go. I would leave. So they knew that eventually I would have this nomadic life. But again, it was us talking about it in retiree age. So when I told them I decided to move it up to now, 
They didn't, they were shocked about how soon that I was making the decision, but it was like, oh, okay. Well, uh, one of my close friends said, well, when you learn a little bit more Spanish, then I'll come visit you. Like, so it's just like, thank you, Kira. Um, my, my dad was more so like, I knew something was up with you. And I'm like, you're just trying to save face. It's okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then, um, I was surprised by some of my family that I guess they, they, they went into a state of grief. And like one time we have a family thread, like a text and they were talking about me as if I wasn't in the thread and like I had passed away or something. And I'm like, Hey, I'm here. Like, I'm gonna, I just remember when. And I'm like, I'll see y'all this Christmas. Like, what is going on? Like, I'm in this sex thread. So it, it was, it's funny. And some of the people, like, I even had one family, I don't know, like, what are you talking about? You acting like I'm going to another planet or something. Um, and then I had one family member that cried and said how they were so sad. And I'm like, well, I only see you once a year. I'm still going to see you once a year. So I don't understand. So it, it, it was mixed. Um, and then I uh, had a lot more like, I guess, third, like extended people that I told that was just inspired and amazed at it. So it was a mixed bag. And that was another reason why I decided to keep my decision to myself, because I did not want to become overwhelmed by the opinions of others, because the opinions of others got me to the state of burnout, selling my house, selling all my stuff and moving to Mexico on a dime's notice. So okay. <laughs> all right, then. Um, I think it is really remarkable that you decided on this course because it is so hard to break. As we've been talking about so far here tonight, the conditioning that gets us in this place starts when we are children. You know, I think Kat made a comment earlier about like, you know, you're not sick. Go ahead and go to school. You got to get perfect attendance, uh, showing up to work sick. I was a public school teacher, y'all. It was so much work for me to miss work. I went to work when I shouldn't have, but like that has been ingrained in us. That is so, that kind of conditioning is so hard to break. So that you had this moment of epiphany, immediately start putting things into place and putting things into motion. And in essence, I mean, like, yes, you had the content that I make, that Stephanie Perry makes, that Rashida Dow makes, but you were basically doing this on your own. Am I right? That's correct. Um, and I started by removing any excuses to talk myself out of it. As I mentioned, one of the first signs of stress and burnout was the acceleration of my alopecia. So I'm like, well, I can't go overseas. Who's going to do my weed? So I shaved my head. Done. Right? Um, <laughs> done. What, what's the next excuse? And that helped me to begin save money for my dream because my hair was 200 plus dollars a month. So I was like, oh, that's money. That's money in the bank. That's money to pay for passports. That's money to pay for residency. Like that's money in the bank. Um, to make it real for me, I started selling big furniture. So my dining room set. So walking through my house, I don't see a dining room set. I don't see sofas. It got real. Because now I'm like, I have jumped. I've taken the leap. At this point, I'm mid-air. Sometimes I would walk through the house and I was like, you can get a new sofa set and just call this whole thing off. Right? And then I'll go to work and I come back and I'm like, how much can I sell this for? <laughs> just give me $2. Just whatever you have. Um, so I, I just began to do it. And I think the more doubts or... Uh, Anything that came up in my mind, I researched it because I wanted to know within myself, without anyone else, without any other voice but my own, is this what you really want? And the answer always, always came back to yes. Even when the things in my life told me it should have been no, 
I know that it, I knew that it felt good. I knew that it was necessary. I knew it was such a strong urge and a calling that I needed to do it now. And it was going to be life altering for me. And if I missed that mark, it could have inadvertently taken me down another course. I don't know what that is, but that's how strongly I felt that I needed to do it right then, right there. Now, um, uh, we're going to take a little break here. Now, you happen to find our content literally, what, a week after Exodus Summit 2022. And, you know, who knows the reason why it turned out the way it did. But if you're listening to Kira's story and you're just like, oh, my God, she's incredible. She she pulled this off in a matter of months all by herself, really without a larger community of other black women trying to do the same thing, looking to embrace ease, to live life in a new way. You're like, Kira is incredible, but I, I can't do that. Um, Exodus Summit, if you're finding this video now, you are like just in time for this year's Exodus Summit. Um, I know many of you watching this uh, right now, especially in the live, are already familiar with Exodus Summit. But just in case the algorithm does what it's supposed to do and somebody uninitiated finds this video, um, this is the preeminent event, online event, for Black women who want to take a sabbatical, they're burnt out, they want to take a break, they want to move abroad, they want to be nomadic, they want to travel, they want to live life that is not centered on work. Um, if you are watching this and you don't have your ticket yet, use this link. It's my affiliate link. Adele gets a little, little bit of something. But um, if this is sounding like something you're interested in, and I can tell you, I have I have talked to a lot of folks. Everybody ain't like Kira and 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 blows up their life and moves in what three months, four months. Everybody ain't like that. Okay. So you don't have to be. Like, okay, I'm ready to do this next month. It could be a year from now. It could be a couple of years from now. But if you're interested and you want to start surrounding yourself with other Black women who are on this same wavelength, you need to check out Exodus Summit. Okay? Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I am in awe that I've I've seen... There are, you know, this is the fourth year of Exodus Summit, and there are still some folks, I always love it when people say, well, yeah, I'm trying to, but they're not making progress toward their, toward the goal that they want. And so if, and that you were able to do this literally on your own, like, and didn't let fear, the, the unknown the, you know, who knows what could happen because there's so many reasons and I, you're probably guilty of this because I know I was, I knew the thing I needed to do to get to the happiness, to get to the life I wanted, but I couldn't make myself do the thing. I couldn't make myself take the first step. So, um, I am, I am just in awe. <laughs> Okay. I won't say completely on my own because again, it was after Exodus Summary and Summit, and it was just a sort like it's a pool of resources. So I took yeah. those things and I continued to build and um, figure out what this applies to me, this doesn't. And then the doubts that I have, I'm like, okay, I saw this, all these different ways people can make money. Like, well, I want to take a, a career. I've never heard of a career sabbatical. I didn't even know that that was a thing. So I was like telling people, I'm going on sabbatical. You know, it became like my new word, sabbatical, sabbatical, career sabbatical. So it, I had all of these um, tools to help me feel better equipped. Um, and again, just going back to how life has been for me, I've always been given the task with little to no direction. 
It's like, okay, you have to go and be the top of your class. You have to go and get the shot. But I've done it with just always by myself. However, learning about Exodus Summit also in designing a life of ease gave me the reassurance that I do not have to do life by myself. Like that, I, I don't have to do this. So I have connected with a lot of people and made connections prior to my move. People were visiting Atlanta. I'm like, oh, you're in Atlanta. Let's hook up. Let's go to lunch. Let's do this. And I'm asking questions. And when I visit Guadalajara, I came to Guadalajara knowing five people <laughs> before I even got here through Exodus Summit. And that is where the switch kind of went off in my brain. And every day I'm thankful. I'm like, I do not have to do life alone. I don't. And that's what Exodus Summit really taught me. Like I have these resources because I had so many questions swirling around in my brain. And I'm like, these people know the answer and they're giving me the answer. They're giving me the cheat code. And if I don't follow through, I have no one to blame but myself because it's there. It's the blueprint. And I have never been given a blueprint for my life. And this was the blueprint, which made me more comfortable and more confident in taking the leap and not waiting, not prolonging it. Okay. So my next question is this, you, you figure out, this is what I need to do. This is the answer to the, the question I wasn't even sure about. But you got all these videos on TikTok. You got all these reels on Instagram. Why share all of this now and not just be like, I found my ease and quietly ride off into the sunset? Because I think it's important for people to know. I think it's important for, because oftentimes people see your highlight reel. They see these things and it's glamorized. And one of the things that I promote is transparency. So I give people the truth, the, the honest, transparent truth, the raw. If this is what you want, this is the cost to that. This is the side effects to this. This is the residue. These are things that you should do out, out or think about or consider outside of this 15 second highlight reel that you see. Like my life is lifing, okay? It is lifing. So let me tell you that also as I do this, I want to document and provide tips and resources on how you can do it as well. Like it's not a facade. And I know for me for a very long time when people are like, I'm so happy I have this life. And I'm like, it got to be a lie. Like you lying. You a liar. Oh, <laughs> we, get, we get people in the comments all the time. Y'all just focusing on the good stuff and not the bad stuff. No, I talk about the bad stuff. It's just my life doesn't suck. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed mm -hmm. to pretend like it does. And that's what it is. I just, I share those with people. I share like, I made this fantastic move. Let me tell you what it cost me. Let me tell you what this piece has cost me. And I think oftentimes when people think about ease, um, some people believe that I'm asking for a life void of difficulties. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for a life that there are going to be growth opportunities. There are going to be things that challenge me, but I also know that I have resources that will help me navigate those. I also know that um, is I'm getting a return on my investment of time, whether that's emotional, miss, I'm getting a return on that. And it's not benefiting anyone else. It's, it's to benefit me. That's what my ease is, that these things are stretching me in directions and allow me to think differently, allow me to approach situations differently, allow me to tap into resources and other people. Because again, I don't have to do life alone. And there are people that genuinely want to help you and not take from you. So, and I want people to know that and that it is okay to walk away from things that no longer serve you. It's not working. Walk away from it. And I promise you, it's going to be uncomfortable, but the reward is so worth it. And I just, I tell people that, I show them that, whether I'm crying one day and happy the next, I am going to show you all of it and you choose what you need to choose. Okay. 
And no, and and that's what I love about your content. And because one of one of my big values is like authenticity. And so I I strive to to be that in in every aspect of my life. And so that's definitely what caught my eye. Um so let let me ask you the question of the night. Why should black women reject hustle culture? <laughs> da, da, da. Um, if I can do it simply, simply put, it doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit you. It's um I believe that it's impeding our ability to dream big. I think it's impeding our ability to use our natural talents, our natural ways of being able to solve and nurture and make better everything that we touch. I think it's, 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 it's hindering that because you can create a life so beautifully for yourself. You don't have to give that to other people. You should reject hustle culture for your health. I look at studies all the time about heart disease, right? Strokes, all these things for Black women. And then we're not even getting the care that we need to combat those things. Like, save your life. It, it is okay to do that. I think you should reject the hustle culture and truly put yourself first. And that's the true definition of self-care. Like, you don't have to do these things. And most importantly, you don't have to perform your way into acceptance, perform your way into love, perform your way after you've already applied for the job. I'm qualified, overly qualified. You made me prove it again in the interview. And I got to continue to prove it every single day. No, I'm not going to perform my way in trying to get you to see my value. Just, it, it's not serving us. I think hustle culture and self-care cannot exist in the same space because hustle culture, one, we don't benefit from it. Even somebody who reached the heights that you did professionally, like on the surface, I think it looks like, oh, you made it. But Ultimately, like in the quality of your life as a human being on this planet, no, no. Um, the, and I agree wholeheartedly with you that hustle culture and this, you know, like you always got to keep going, sleep when you're dead, strive, strive, strive. Your value is in what you produce. That cannot be why we are on this planet because I just, I refuse to accept that that is why I was born because I, I have, I have struggled. Whereas you were the achiever, the overachiever. I've always struggled with not wanting to achieve and feeling bad about it because this culture we live in says that's what I'm supposed to want. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. It's oh okay. It's, it's it's good. My brain is old. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I was um going back through some journal entries because I'm re-entering like practicing gratitude every day. Like, you know, like just what it is. So I went back and looked at some things. October 7th last year, my journal entry at the end, I put this cannot be my life. Because I'm like, this can't be my life. And literally a few days later, that's when I, I saw all this. And I'm just like, oh, I'm out of here. But I, I went through, I saw it yesterday. I went through my journals, October 7th, last year. I'm like, this cannot be my life. There has to be a better way. And it is. So I jumped on it. <laughs> and see, I feel like, and I've been saying this for a little while, the the whole hustle culture system and all of that, one of the things that it it is very good at is keeping us from listening to our inner selves, whether that is your intuition, whether that is your body, what your body is telling you, 
because when you try to fit into hustle culture, you say, my stomach don't feel good, but I got this meeting today. And you push that down. You know, uh, my hair is falling out. I ain't got really time to deal with this because I've got clients to deal with. You push that to the side. And it is not really until either forced because I've, I've talked to women who they got sick and that made them slow down, or it was the pandemic where they finally were forced to sit still and sit with themselves and then start noticing and listening. It is not until you give yourself some space that you really start to figure out and hear like, I've never really liked this, or this has never really sat right with me. And that's that's one of the reasons that Ivana and I uh, created the retreat, Reclaim the Retreat, is because it's hustle culture is very loud. It's very hard to listen inward when you've got all these people with these demands, you've got all these societal demands around you. I'm not going to say yelling at you, but pulling at you and drowning out what your inner voice is saying. Because I feel like by the time we hear our inner voice, it is something like really bad. Like I'm about to have a stroke or, you know, like, because it, I feel like your body's been yelling at you so long. And so that's why it's, it's so important to step away. Take the sabbatical, um, because I know there's somebody probably watching this, and they're thinking, this job got me burnt out. I really could use some time away. Take the sabbatical. (laughs) Uh, Go away and do nothing. If, If it even needs to be a staycation, but some time when you don't have that, that, that pressure to produce and to be on and to be things to all of these people. I think everybody, everybody needs that. Um, I see a lot of people comment commenting about the pandemic. And I think that was my first eye opener. I was working virtually years before the pandemic, um, but it was still busy. Again, being on board of directors, there were a lot of professional events I had to go to, plus the chauffeuring of the kids and everything. So when we were sheltering in place, even though the demands by me being a remote worker um, increased, I began to notice like, I actually enjoy my house, right? (laughs) I'm nurturing my plants. In the morning, I get up and I sit on my back porch and I drink my coffee and I listen to the birds. Like, I really enjoy this. Isn't that why you get the job to buy the house? Like, that's the whole that point. I never of it, enjoyed right? my porch. I never enjoyed the porch because I'm I need to leave because the commute is an hour plus and I'm trying to get ahead of the traffic. So I'm enjoying my house. Um, I'm not having to run and pick up this kid and drop this one off and do this and do that. And I think that was the first time that I realized that. I'm doing a lot because I would tell people about my life and I'm like, oh, there's so much. And I'm like, no, I know people that do more. Like, no, no, nothing. And that's how I felt. Like, I'm not doing enough. That's what I was feeling like. I'm not doing enough. Meanwhile. What does that say? Doing what you were doing and you felt like you weren't doing enough. Wow. Still. And I was in a dual degree program. (laughs) Finishing college. Had a podcast doing all this stuff, like doing all of the things and always felt like it just wasn't enough and sheltering in place and calming down. When things began to open back up, I began to get anxiety about having to bring all these things back on. And I never fully got back to the place of my life being as busy as it was before. But as more things were added to my plate, I just kept asking myself, how in the world was I doing this? I'm not doing it. I'm struggling. I for my ask life. myself that all the time now. I'm like, I don't know how I used to, the life I had before. I I can't fathom how I did that. Showing mm-hmm. up at a place, working all them hours, going from here to I. I don't know how I did it. It was a lot. <laughs> um, 
we I thought we had a question. Somebody asked, are you near, are you around 40 something changes for women at 40? I don't know what my body is doing. <laughs> All kind of stuff. <laughs> it may be. I don't know. I think this is the first time that I've sat still enough to really even be intentional, like intentionally pay attention to my body and what's what it needs. Um, so I am learning my body. Um, I'm learning to listen to it. Um and pay attention to a lot of things and not just go and, you know, you go to the doctor, subscribe to something, you're on out the door. Let's just take this in the morning. You're good. Um, so it's a, a, a lot of that. So I'm learning my 40 something body all over again. Um, and it's been interesting and I'm treating it better. And I'm like, oh, you, you're a little bit more agile than what I thought you were. So <laughs> I, I think I, I think we're going to come out OK. <laughs> I, I was going to put up Kimmy's question, but I think you literally just answered this. When you look back at where you were, do you say, how the heck was I able to live through that? I don't know how I was doing it. I really don't. And I said, this is probably why people kept calling me Superwoman in Supermom. And, and that know. is something you should never want anybody to call you. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying this to you, Kira, because I think you know that now. But there's somebody watching this who, who is trying to be superwoman, who people are telling you that, and they mean it as a compliment. But if you're doing so much that people outside of you, you know, strangers, folks here, all this, all the shit you do. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're superwoman. Take that as a warning that you are doing too much and you need to reevaluate some things. That is not a compliment. I don't believe yeah. it. Is. And, and part of me also thinks too, because as I mentioned, I did a lot of mentoring for like professional development. And I think I'm like, I have coached a lot of people <laughs> on how to do more, to do more and promise that they will get the promotion and promise that they would um, get the raise. And a part of me feels like you asked earlier, like why I share, because I, I need to write that, that you don't have to do all of that. You really don't. Um, and some of those people, they follow me now and I have to let them know, girl, let me tell you what was really going on behind the scenes. <laughs> As Ivana <laughs> tells me all the time, you make the best, you made the best decision for what you knew at the time. You now know different things. And so you are allowed to make different choices. And, and I feel you on that because I've had to have a few of those conversations myself. It's like, yeah, I know that's what I said you should be doing, but being where I am now in life, I can tell you that no, yeah. <laughs> you should not be doing all that. Yeah. Um, I want to thank Jess for the super chats. Appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing, ladies. We need it all. Um, oops. Hold on. I'm having some struggles over here <laughs> trying to click through these. Um, I was trying to see if there was another question here. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, okay. So I, I often re refer to the radical changes I made about eight years ago in my life as blowing up my life. I firmly believe you blew up your life, girl. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I think there is a woman who might be watching this who is like, I, I, can't, I can't do nothing radical like that. I can't just blow up this life that I have worked so hard to build. But I do want more ease. Um, she's probably a little unfulfilled, but can't like put her finger on what it is. So to that woman who's not ready to blow her life up, how can she start designing ease into her life? 
Well, I think the first step is to really envision what your dream life would be. Um, I know a lot of people talk about vision boards, right? They do these vision boards, but something I take a little a step further with the vision board is to really meditate and center, dream up your life. What is it that you do when you wake up? How do you move about your day? How do you go to sleep? What are you wearing? What are you eating, drinking? Like romanticize your life. Once you have that visual in your head, write those things down because that's the end game. That is the life of ease. Like romanticize it. Dream it up as big as you can. Void of anything that you know, like really dream that life up. After you've done that, you want to examine where you are now and then begin to identify the areas in your life that are causing you the greatest amount of stress. So even though, again, you're not blowing your life up, I need to identify where my stresses are because it doesn't look like me getting lattes at 11, taking a 15 minute business call and me going back to the office when I want to. So where is that? Um, is it physical, mental, emotional well-being, your relationships, your career, your finances, your personal growth? Like, what are these areas in my life that are causing me the greatest amount of stress? And then you want to begin to make minor changes every day to get you closer to it. Uh, so whether that is centering yourself a little in the morning, um, is something else that I learned about this called like a gratitude shower, right? So maybe you don't have a lot of times, but when you're in the shower, be in the shower, don't think about anything else and express gratitude. I think, you know, I'm thankful for my arms that I have the ability to move those. I thank you for this belly. It allowed me to, it is uh, um, evidence that I'm eating good, you know, just like show gratitude in those moments. Um, and appreciation there. Um, so after you've figured out your dream life, say, okay, these are the areas of stress, begin to make the minor adjustments for that. I think that will allow you to gently flow into the ease. And then most importantly, begin to evaluate your circle, the people that you have around you, choosing if you need to readjust where your boundaries are and reminding yourself the boundaries are for me, not for you, right? They're for me to know where my healthy spot are. And it's okay that I'm going to continue to remind you that you've met the boundary, you're at your limit. And I'm okay with reminding you of that. I'm okay with reminding me of that. Um, and then it sometimes even comes into changing out the people in your circle, right? Uh, people that's able to pour into you and not constantly take from you. So the more you do that, the more you're going to have people that love you, support you. They're going to feed that positivity. They're, you're going to have that increased level of gratification. And that becomes the new drug instead of the hustle culture. culture. And you're going to want more and more and more of that. And you're going to be able to see the minor adjustments manifest in your life. And then you'll hopefully begin to know like whatever you want, whatever you want, you can have it. Only thing you have to do is just want it and go after it. So just the, the small things. So yeah, romanticize your life, go for it. I love this for you, Aileen. I'm setting off little firecrackers on my way to the Big Bang, but visualizing my stresses and what I want for the future to look like is a great first step. Mm -hmm. I I, I want to say that's that's where it all started for me. Like I put down, I did the thing where you put down the life that you want. And I then marked like, well, why don't I have this? What's standing in the way of this thing? Or who is standing in the way of this thing? And uh, I had to make some changes. Wasn't easy, but I did it. And uh, I'm, I'm forever grateful that I did. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if y'all have any more questions. Um Kira, did you see the question uh, in the private chat? Uh, let's see here. Um, I, I can. Okay. okay. So um, I did see the question earlier. Someone asked how my kids are adjusting. 
And what I would say, and this goes into, I'm not going to say hustle culture, but it goes into designing a life of ease. My kids said that they understood why I wanted to have this change. And they were vocal in their reluctancy. But, you know, I did all of the things. Um, they gave me a list of things that they needed. I asked them, what do you need to be comfortable with this? And when I say they gave me a list, they gave me a list. <laughs> and I went out and I was able to solve for all of those things. Um, and again, with my kids growing up in America and doing what they do, they did the same thing to me. They moved the goalposts. <laughs> they moved the goalposts for me to be okay with this move. Um, fast forward, we get here and things weren't settling in as much as they would like, and they were unhappy. And a part of me moving here and designing a life of ease was making sure that my kids were happy in their environment. Um, to put things in perspective, I'm a divorcee. I've been divorced for over 10 years. And I had, in designing the ease for my life, know that it was okay for my kids to go back to America to live with their dad. And just because I am mom does not mean that I have to hold that weight by myself. And it is okay to share the responsibility with the other parent. And that's what I did. So my kids are back in America, loving their lives. They are smiling again. They are happy again. And that's all that matters. I gave it a try. I put everything into consideration for them. I positioned everything that they would need. And most importantly, I ensured that my children attended therapy to help them with the transition, during the transition, and post the transition. And I think that some, if that's what you all believe in, I know some people don't, I do. I'm going I'm to tear the therapist up. I'm going to be there. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> me personally. Uh, so I did that. So I, I was making sure that I was caring for them holistically. And I realized that, again, I have to put mom first because if I continue to live the life in America to ensure that my kids had the things that made them comfortable, what would it look like if I burn myself out or like you said, I have a stroke, heart attack, where I'm not physically able or God forbid, not able to even live through that? How is that advantageous to them? So I had to come to terms with myself, understand that I'm going to make this decision. I'm thankful that they have a father that's able to step in to do this. And in turn, what I am teaching them to do, and they're able to witness firsthand, is how to live your life wholeheartedly and authentically, and how to live for yourself and being okay with following through with decisions for yourself. And also that you can not only manifest, but you can live a life that you want. And whatever it is that you dream is not impossible. You can have it. Um, and don't let anyone or anything tell you no. Um, and something I teach them is no is not N-O. It's K-N-O-W. What don't I know? Who don't I know? What don't they know about me in order for you to achieve these things? So I, I pride myself on being one. I just don't talk the talk. I walk the walk. And I want my children to know and have a parent that they are proud of. And most importantly, that they are able to say, you know, the kids don't remember what you did, right? <laughs> you can talk. They don't remember what you did. So I want them to have that experience. Um, and we talked about it. So when we do our check-ins, they said they continue to be happy with the decision. Um, but at any point, they know mom is going to be there. So that's how the kids are adjusting. And my my mind blew up, sorry, blew up again. I blew up my own world. But now to have this life that was centered around my children, and now I'm, I don't know anything. Because I went from being the preacher's daughter to the wife to the mom, to the exact. I've never been Kira, just me, just me. So the blessing, the silver lining in all of this is that I have an opportunity to truly heal and truly like live for me, live for me. I, I, I never imagined this. I never imagined this. I was like, oh, this thing get better. <laughs> 
we're not supposed to live for us. That's, that is not how the system is designed. Um, And you sharing that, I appreciate it. My youngest was in ninth, no, she was in eighth grade when we got divorced. She was in ninth grade when I decided to move abroad. I wanted her to come with me. And she was like, no, nah, I'm I'm not into that. You go do you, whatever. She ended up coming the first year and she had a ball. But there were people on the outside looking at me like, oh, you're not, your kid doesn't want to go. You're not just going to give up this dream you have and stay mm-hmm. and sacrifice because that's what a mother does. I'd be wanting to punch some people in the throat. Um, <laughs> but again, this system that we've all been conditioned by, that is how it defines us as women. Like you're supposed to want to be a mother. And if you mm-hmm. end up being a mother, that is supposed to be your identity and everything mm-hmm. you do. You, the person, Kira, the individual, Adelia, the individual, we don't really matter. Maybe when they are adults and they got their own life, maybe you can have some, some, some of what you want then. And that's stupid. I don't have super eloquent words tonight, but that's stupid. Yeah. And that's, that's, it's so important. Now, and I think that has been the most, the greatest part of me that I've had to adjust because a lot of my move was centered around my kids. So even initially in designing my ease, I still wasn't fully designing it for me. And I want to say as a mom, you have to design it for you. And I've had a number of conversations with my kids to tell them, yes, I'm mom, but let me introduce you to Shakira, the woman. I want you to know who I am and why this is so important for me so that I can be my best self for you. And and they get that. And I think sometimes we... Um, just have to do it all. And I don't, I don't. And my prayer is that my investment that I have given to them is enough for, for them to, you know, for them to be sustained. And I know that, and I believe that. Um, so it's for it, <laughs> like, just, just do it, just do it. And it's okay. It's okay. So now my joke is that's the perks of divorce to go with your daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, I think, I think, I think we've done it. Uh, I am so grateful that you uh, accepted my invitation. I was creeping in your inbox uh, as, was it Lena? Somebody said what a, what several people have said, what a great conversation this was. Um, If, If you enjoyed this, feel free to give the video a thumbs up. Um, If you are watching this and you are not subscribed, this is this these are the kinds of conversations that we have on this channel. Um, I said today on Instagram about we're gonna say the the quiet part out loud. Um, And so if if you enjoyed this hit the like button, subscribe. If there is a woman in your life that you think needs to hear this conversation, share share the video with them. Um, Y'all can keep up with Kira. There are links in the description. Her YouTube channel is linked. Her IG and her TikTok are linked. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that I want to say? I don't know. I don't know. But thank you all for coming to hang out with us on this Wednesday night. Thank you, Kira, for being here. And oh, I do know what I want to say. If you enjoyed this conversation, I think you will enjoy uh, Friday's episode of the podcast, the Picky Girl Travels podcast. Uh, It wasn't intentional, but it is kind of in this same vein. It is going to premiere at 
noon Eastern and Ivana and I will be uh, in the comments live. So we'll all get to watch it at the same time. Um, but yeah, thank y'all for being here. And thank you again, Kira. Thank you for inviting